open your Bibles to Isaiah uh, chapter 40. Well, on a scale of uh, 1 to 10, of being uh, ready for Christmas this year, with 10 being very ready and 1 being not even started, where do you fit? Are you absolutely ready or not even started? I was singing carols on Thursday evening around some of the streets in the Townsend area here. And I realized that the bakers are hardly above two, at least in terms of the Christmas lights and the tree and the decorations. There I was standing on Thursday evening under several lampposts in front of all those houses dazzlingly lit with glowing Santas and Rudolph and snowmen and and angels while our fake Christmas tree is still boxed up in the attic. I guess the upside is we're going to save a lot on our electric bill in the next few weeks. So, so what can a man do, A, to get into the Christmas mood? Well, you can try DAB radio, DAB radio, which I did as I drove home on Thursday night. Did you know that at this time of the year, there are stations playing Christmas songs 24 hours a day? 24 hours a day! Well, after 10 minutes in the car, let me say this, if there is one thing which can put you right off the festive season, it's Radio Magic Christmas. So in a bid to escape, I, I uh, selected Radio 5 Live. Only they happened to be running a Christmas quiz, and listeners had to insert the word Brexit into the first line of a well-known Christmas song. And last Thursday, wait for it, the front runner was, I wish it could be Brexit every day. Somehow, I don't think Theresa May believes that, eh? Listening to the sentimental music of of Magic Christmas, I realized that it all seems so far removed from the real world. What has Bing Crosby's I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas got to do with the Syrian crisis, with the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar, or North Korean nuclear war games. And because Christmas is still associated somehow with the manger, the shepherds, the angels, and the wise men, it raises a similar kind of question. What has baby Jesus got to do with a world where children die of starvation, where the people you love may may not get through the next few months. Well, everything, in fact. Because if you strip back the tinsel, you discover that the good news comes into a world first time round, just like ours. The occupying Roman Empire is trying to impose its will by raising taxes. A paranoid King Herod issues an order to kill all children under two. You see, forget the, 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 the picture-perfect Christmas cards that we send where, frankly, the Bethlehem manger looks like the uh, penthouse suite in the Savoy. The original Christmas was messy. It was played out in the context of power politics and human life appearing so very cheap. And into such a world, the New Testament writers claim that in Jesus, God comes. And the word which God speaks is the word which began our reading from Isaiah 40. Comfort. Comfort my people. In a world of pain and confusion and fear, we have in Jesus the promise of comfort. That is God's word to us. And that is God's word to the people that Isaiah is addressing here in our reading. Like many of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah sees things at many levels at the same time. He sees the nation of Israel about to experience war and and occupation. They're going to be exiled from their homeland. Many of them will live in refugee camps where they will weep by the rivers of, of Babylon The symbols of their identity, the temple and and, and the city of Jerusalem, they're going to be removed. Their lives will be shattered. They will ask the questions that so many people ask when their world is turned upside down. Where is God in all this? What's he doing? You see, it is 
often the case that in that position, we can interpret events the wrong way. We can lose perspective. And we, we, we hear some of that loss of perspective towards the end of this amazing chapter. Just listen to verse 27. Here's Israel losing perspective. Verse 27, why do you say, says Isaiah of the people, why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Where, where has God gone? The people are asking. Has he forgotten us? Is he powerless? You see, this chapter of the Bible is really all about getting things into the proper perspective. So Isaiah says to the people of his day, I want you to see what I see. Yeah, things are tough, but there's a light of hope in the distance. You may be desperate right now. You may feel your vulnerability. You may lose everything. But God is coming to the rescue. There's a day on the horizon when the captives will return, when the city walls and the temple will be re rebuilt, when the nation will be restored. And Isaiah was right. The exiled people of Judah did return home. And what is happening in the Middle East today? Especially with the recent announcement by the White House that Jerusalem is exclusively Israel's capital. All of that is impossible to get a handle on without Isaiah's perspective. And the reason, by the way, that modern day Israel longs for a more secure future is because in the big sweep of Isaiah's prophecy, he saw that Judah's restoration would not last long. That the house of David would fall again, first to the Greek empire of Alexander the Great, and then, of course, to Rome and the Caesars. And so it was that while Caesar Augustus ruled the world, these ancient words of the prophet, they come true once more. Comfort. Comfort my people. But this time, those words would be true at an even deeper and more permanent level. For the promise of God's comfort would be for the entire world now, not just for ethnic Israel. For now, God would speak not through an 8th century prophet, but through a baby's cry in the stable of Bethlehem. Here then are the four voices of Christmas. The first one we've already begun to consider and underline, comfort. Comfort. We hear that voice not just once, but three times in the opening verses. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. We're not talking comfort fabric softener here, or the warm glow of, of mulled wine on a cold winter's night. Now, this is the inner strength which trust in God breathes into us, the comfort which puts heart and new life back into people. There's a, a good little illustration of this from the Bayer Tapestry, which chronicles the, the Norman conquest of 1066. A bunch of confused and frightened soldiers are running away from the enemy. But in the next scene, the same soldiers are shown back in rank, facing the battle again. And the reason for this change of heart can be seen behind them. Because there's a bishop called Odo, and he's wielding a, a giant lance with which he's prodding the bottoms of the soldiers. And the caption underneath the scene reads, the bishop comforts the troops. You see, that's the old English word for comfort, which means to, to put fight back into people. And that is the comfort that Isaiah is interested in, the comfort which helps those who have lost perspective, who don't know where God is. 
And, and the source of the comfort here in the 8th century is the promise that God is on his way to deliver his people. That there may be exile, but beyond that there is hope. Hope of rescue and return. God will come. He will bring them back home. And here we are, 2,800 years later, after Isaiah. And the word of comfort to us is this. Not God will come, but that God has come. That in Jesus, God became human. He came among us. To experience a suffering world and a fragile planet, he came as the Savior. God does something about our situation by stepping into history. The, uh, the American astronaut Jim Irwin was involved in the Apollo space missions of the 1970s. He was the eighth person to walk on the moon. But this was his perspective on that extraordinary journey for him. He said on one occasion, the greatest miracle is not that man walked on the moon, but that God walked on the earth. Of course, the coming of God does not resolve all our problems or immunize us to the pain and the anguish of life. The comfort is that God, the creator, has become vulnerable to the struggles of his created order. That he experiences our questions and darkness, that he takes on our human condition. But but the comfort is more than that God knows what it's like, but that he's done something about our situation. Because you and I don't just need somebody who says, I know how you feel. We need someone who says, I'm going to deal with the source of your deepest fears and your greatest problems. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Her sin has been paid for. That's the promise of forgiveness. That's the comfort of Christmas. For everything which we deeply fear comes out of a broken relationship to God and the consequences of that in a broken world. You shall call his name Jesus. Joseph and Mary are told. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Her sin has been paid for, says the prophet. You see, there's that word again. That word which explains the world in which we live and why it's in such a mess. The word which explains why we need a savior. Because sin is the human tendency to want to make life all about me, to push God away and, and to reject his authority over my life so that I remain in control of it. That's why in the end Jesus dies on the cross, to pay for my sin and yours, to rescue us in our fundamental relationship to God. And so perhaps the greatest news of all which Christmas gives us is this, I have a savior who promises to forgive me for all the stuff in my life which indicates just how selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed, and self-righteous I am. I have a savior from that. The good news which Christmas tells us is that I can be forgiven no matter how far I am from God. And it's it's that movement of the human heart away from God which introduces the second voice of Christmas. If the first is comfort, the second voice is prepare. Verse three, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. 
This was the note sounded in the Near East when an emperor or some other VIP was to visit an eastern city. We call it today giving them the red carpet treatment. The citizens would make the streets tidy, their homes would be cleared and cleaned up, and the local council would build a new approach road into the city for the royal procession. Now imagine, imagine the panic when the highways department in Jerusalem gets a call from this crazy prophet to say that a five-lane motorway needs to be built in the desert. Don't you realize, Isaiah, there's a recession on? Jerusalem hasn't been building anything for 70 years. And you want a road in the desert? But this isn't, this isn't any old road. Because this isn't any royal dignitary. Isaiah is issuing a call to get ready for God. Prepare the way for the Lord. This God will be able to construct a pathway to bring the nation back across that Syrian desert from Babylon. And nothing will stand in his way. Every valley shall be raised up, verse 4. Every mountain and hill be made low. The rough ground shall become level. And the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And if there are any remaining doubts... For Isaiah's listeners at this point, any doubt that God can deliver his people, then from verse 12, Isaiah draws this beautiful picture of God's power. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? It's a picture of God's power. That's why he will make a, a highway in the desert. Well, what, what can you measure, says Isaiah, with, with the hollow of your hand? Just a few drops of water. What can you measure with the span of your hand? Well, just a few inches. What can you carry in your bucket? A few things that you might buy at the market. What small ingredients do you weigh on the kitchen scales as you make the Christmas pudding this year? A few raisins, a few ounces of butter and flour or whatever. Now, think about God, says the prophet. What's in the hollow of his hand? The oceans of the world. What does God measure off with his hand span? The heavens themselves. What will you find in God's basket? The dust of the entire earth. What does God weigh on his scales? The mountains and the hills. So this God of majestic power and glory speaks both a word of comfort and a word of challenge to us. Prepare. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare, get ready. That's one of the big words for Christmas, isn't it? Prepare. Some of us started praying for Christmas last January. And we do that every year. Many of those living on the Townsend estate must have been putting things into place weeks ago in order for their light festival illuminations to be so impressive. But the preparation that really matters is to prepare the way for the Lord in the desert. Notice that? That's where making room for God takes place in our lives. There, in the desert of the human heart. In the wilderness experiences of life, where God becomes real to people. As in the desert, we face up to the issues that need dealing with in us. And we start getting rid of the obstacles, the roadblocks which stand in the way of, of knowing God. You know the old word for that? It's the word repentance. 
And that was the word that John the Baptist, out in the Judean desert, was calling the people of Israel to hear, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the second voice of Christmas. The third voice is frailty. You see, look at the text, verse 6. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fail, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Do you see how this voice is not God's? actually, but ours? A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? And here's the the human cry, all men are like grass. That's our cry. And of course, it's a voice which contrasts with the glory of God. We cry out of our frailty, out of our awareness that we are weak and vulnerable and finite For we are all in the end like autumn leaves, like grass that grows and withers. Yeah, human glory is real. We do have glory, but our human glory is not permanent. We may feel invincible when we're young. We may reach the heights in our career. We may achieve fame and fortune, recognition and respect, but eventually... All of us must face our mortality. The strength will fade. The body will weaken. The mind will succumb. We cannot avoid the passing of time. We are food for worms. We are dust that dreams. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Last year, the the former heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali, the greatest, passed away only aged 74. And for the last decade of his life, Ali, this once remarkable athlete who could float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, was reduced to a shuffling, shaking shadow of a man by Parkinson's. There's a, there's a story about Ali, probably apocryphal, uh, of the time when he was on a plane and he was very, very reluctant to put on his safety belt, to buckle up. And the stewardess motioned to him several times, Mr. Ali, please, you need to buckle up. We, we're going to take off. Ma'am, Superman don't need no safety belt. To which the stewardess replied, Mr. Ali, Superman don't need no plane. (laughs) The glory of man fades. God's glory is everlasting. The word of God, says the prophet, stands forever. And God's word, like his power, is invincible and eternal. So what is God's final word to us as we wrap up this message this morning? What's the last voice of Christmas? Good news. Hear it? Verse 9, you who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. That's the fourth voice of Christmas, good news. And that was good news for the exiles in Isaiah's day. God is going to storm across the desert and bring his people back home. So the heralds on the mountaintops and the gatekeepers of the towns and the villages of Judah are to announce the good news 
Here comes your God. Now for us, for us, the good, the good news of God's coming into our world is not with such obvious and public fanfare. No, no, no. 2,000 years ago, God slips quietly into the stream of history and lies in the manger at Bethlehem. Graham Kendrick wrote the musical Rumors of Angels several years ago now, and one of the really quite remarkable songs in that uh, repertoire is the song, What Kind of Greatness? Let me just read to you the second verse of Kendrick's What Kind of Greatness? As he reflects upon the the coming of God into our world in, in silence, really, and in weakness. The one in whom we live and move in swaddling clothes lies bound. The voice that cried, let there be light, asleep without a sound. The one who strode among the stars and called each one by name lies helpless in a mother's arms and must learn to walk again. Here is your God, the shepherds are told by the angels on the Judean hillsides. Good news of great joy for all the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. That is Christmas. In a world of global uncertainty where people live in fear of the future, unsure of what to believe and who to trust, the good news is God himself. The God who comes with power to deliver us from our enemies, to defeat the powers that have enslaved us. Here is your God. But this God who comes in power comes also in compassion. The arm that rules is at the same time the arm that carries the young and the tender and the vulnerable. Verse 11 of our passage, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart and gently leads those that have young. The warrior king whose arm is powerful, is also the good shepherd. For the comfort of the awesome creator God is going to be expressed in the comfort of the shepherd God. Now, Isaiah glimpses all this from from a distance. But we see God right up close in Jesus. Jesus, the good shepherd, who comes to lay down his life for the sheep, Jesus, God to the rescue, the one who, according to the angel, will save his people from their sins. Do you get that? Jesus will not save good people or nice people or church-going people or sincere people, but his people. That's who he comes to save. So who then are his people? Well, if it helps you, think of the the queen doing her Christmas broadcast in a couple of weeks' time on Christmas Day. There she is, surrounded by portraits and the corgis hanging on every word. And in her speech, she sometimes refers to us as, you, my people. And that's right. We are her people. As members of the United Kingdom, we're the people constitutionally over whom Queen Elizabeth rules. And when the angel talks about his people, Jesus' people, he means the same. He means the people Jesus rules over, the people who willingly accept Jesus as their king. Now, lots of us in the room this morning started out life under the rule of Elizabeth, Because we were born under her rule. She was queen then, as she's queen now. But none of us starts out life under the rule of Jesus. 
Because we're born with a nature that wants to keep him from being in charge of us. So to be one of his people, you have to become one. There's a definite step to be taken. And it means admitting that up until now, I've not been living for Christ as I should. It means asking his forgiveness for that. And it means accepting him from now on as king over my life. And the glorious good news is that as we take those steps of repentance and prepare our hearts, he promises to come to us. And what does this majestic God of awesome power do as he comes to us? Well, listen to the words which end this great chapter of the Bible. Do you not know, have you not heard, The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. You see, that is the perspective we need. And only the God of Scripture can give it to us. For God, who in Jesus became one of us, suffering and dying, rose again. Only the king of life and death can rescue us. This this magnificent chapter begins and ends then with comfort. The comfort of God to the weary to those overwhelmed by their circumstances, to the weak, those with limited capacity. The good news for the weak and the overwhelmed is that God is with us. For the great revolution that God wants to work in the human heart is not to turn us into self-reliant people, but into those who come under his rule, who trust and hope in him. People who know that they are grass, but that he and his word endures forever. And it's those who believe that who will endure. It's the weak who will prevail. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We will prevail because our strength is not human in the end, but divine. We will We will run and keep running against all the odds. We will keep trusting God. We will not give up. We will make it. And we will get there because God's word is true. Because God's glory is great. And because God's plans are sure. There will be a future for those who are his people. Never, ever, ever lose that perspective. Let's pray. Lord, help us this morning to gain perspective. Maybe we're surrounded by our own weakness, our own sense of frailty, our own confusion. We wonder where you are. We want to know what you're doing. Lord, help us to gain perspective from you, the awesome creator God. May we gain perspective from you, the shepherd God, the one who comes into our world as Emmanuel, God with us. May we hear the voice of Christmas, comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Amen.